Welcome, this is going to be a video lecture discussing ultrasound guided peripheral vascular access. First off, the probe we're going to be using for ultrasound guided vascular access is your linear array probe. This will offer you a high resolution, high frequency image for good localization of the vascular structures and the needle during the procedure. We're going to be discussing some definitions and differentiating between superficial versus deep veins because this makes a difference in the anatomy. Now this refers to the type of vein it is, not its shallowness or depth. When we talk about superficial veins, what we're talking about is veins that run alone and are generally superficial and near the surface. See a superficial vein, it is traveling alone, it is not paired with an artery. Versus deep veins are those veins that are paired with an artery and part of the neurovascular bundle. Here you can see the brachial vein and artery, which are paired structures. And this tells me that this vein is the brachial vein and a deep vein. Superficial veins, you can see on, along the surface of your arm, starting with the antecubital fossa, coming up to the basilic and cephalic vessels, and continuing down into the forearm. Whereas your deep veins are going to be your deeper structures, such as the brachial vein, along with the paired brachial artery. Now, in order to perform vascular access, we have to differentiate between an artery versus a vein. One of the easiest ways to do so is to use compression. And what we're going to do is we're going to find a vessel. Here we see a superficial vein. And we're going to just press down with the probe, compressing the vessel. If the vessel compresses easily, that tells you that it's most likely a vein. Here you can see the superficial vein and the paired brachial artery and vein. And when you compress, you can see the superficial vein and the brachial vein both compress while the brachial artery stays open. And this is because of the lower pressure in the venous system compared to the arterial system. A caveat is that if your patient is profoundly hypotensive with a very low arterial pressure, you may be able to compress the artery. Another way is to look at the pulsatility of the vessel. So when we first start to compress the vessels, you'll see the veins collapse and you'll be able to note the pulsatility of the artery there. So you can see here we've compressed the brachial vein and the paired artery next to it is having some pulsatility to it. If you're unsure if it is an artery or vein, one of the ways to confirm and to clear it up, especially in the hypotensive patient, is the use of spectral Doppler. This will tell you whether it's an artery or vein regardless of compressibility or blood pressure. So what's going to happen is you're going to localize that artery and you're going to initiate the spectral Doppler on your machine. You'll place the gate within the vessel. And once again, we're looking at identification of artery versus vein. We're not necessarily looking for systolic velocities or things like that. So we can do this in the short axis without angle correction or many of the other things you may see in carotid studies. And you can see here we have the gate within the lumen of the vessel and we have a nice brisk upstroke, a very high systolic peak. This tells me that this is an artery. And if your machine is equipped with audio, you'll hear that arterial pulsation that we're very used to when we're looking for peripheral pulses with a handheld Doppler. In contrast, when you place it over a vein, you'll see this undulating pattern without those repeated systolic peaks. You will also hear more of the venous whooshing noise. Now, you also have the ability to do what is called augmentation with Doppler in order to help confirm that this is a venous structure. If you are going to do augmentation, you're going to place your probe in a proximal position and you're going to augment the flow through the vein by compression distal to your probe. And what's going to happen is that compression will force blood through the venous system past the probe, showing a spike in the venous flow. You can do this with color Doppler, and you can see here we're localizing a vein. We have color Doppler on, and when we squeeze, you see that flash of blood flow as you increase the flow through that vessel in the position of the probe. You can also do this with spectral Doppler, when you have Doppler on the vessel and you squeeze, you see that augmentation of flow. Another thing to note is the nerve. Remember, it is a neurovascular bundle. You have a deep vein paired with an artery with a nearby nerve. So if you look here at this venous structure here, we have the paired brachial artery and vein, and we have a nerve right there. You can see the nerve structure as a honeycomb appearance or okra, or that little vesicle appearance. And here we have a superficial vein, a deep vein, a deep artery, and the nerve. And one of the things you want to note about the nerve position is that you can manipulate the arm to make sure the nerve is not in your way as you try to cannulate that vein. Here's another example with the nerve, vein, and artery. And remember, the nerves travel with the deep veins, not with the superficial vein. So we're going to talk about choosing an appropriate vessel to access. Now remember, there are some caveats. Patients that have AV fistulas, lymph node dissections, or major surgery in the upper arm, you may want to avoid the upper arm vessels. If the patient has renal insufficiency and may require AV fistula creation in that arm, you may want to avoid vessels above the antecubital fossa.
However, there are also unstable patients who are in an emergent condition and require rapid vascular access in order for stabilization. So the right vein is a moving target depending on the patient condition, their history, and the anatomy. But what we're going to talk about is mapping out the vasculature to find an appropriate vessel. You can see here in the forearm, starting with the antecubital fossa, we can move up or down the arm. We also have the option of deeper vessels. In order to map and find the vessels, what you want to do is start off in the antecubital fossa, and you can track down, looking for the forearm cephalic and basilic vessels in addition to the antecubital fossa and track up looking for more proximal vessels. And remember, the choice is that we would prefer to do more distal vasculature over proximal vasculature. The more shallow the vessel, the easier it is to cannulate, and superficial vessels rather than deep vessels. Remember, the deep vessels are gonna be in that neurovascular bundle, so you wanna make sure you can avoid the nerve when you're accessing. And if you're doing a deep vessel, or superficial vessel, you should still be doing this as a sterile procedure. So choosing the vein site, you wanna map out the vein. What you're gonna do is follow the vessel both proximal and distal and see the course of the vessel and if there's any branch points. Remember, the course of the vein does not necessarily follow in a straight line along the arm. You can see here on the forearm, we have multiple vessels in the antecubital fossa, the upper arm and the lower arm. And what you wanna do is find nice straight segments of the vein that you can assess and access as depicted here. And what you wanna be able to do is track along that vessel and find a nice long straight segment that you'll be able to localize, visualize, and cannulate. As you're scanning along that vessel, keep an eye out for little bulges in the vessel. And what these are, are the valves in the vein system. These are important to note. You can cannulate and pass a catheter through the valve, but you do not want to stick and cannulate into the valve itself. So make sure at the valves, you do not want to puncture through the valve itself because you can damage the leaflet. And damaging the leaflet can cause some venous insufficiency in the future. But you can pass a catheter through the valve if you cannulate proximally. So while you're also watching for bulges for vessels, you also want to watch for those bifurcations and those branch points. And as you're mapping the vein, you're going to follow that vessel and you're going to see several vessels branch together. And what you want to avoid is accessing at that branch point. You can access either of the branches or more proximal to it. Just do not access at the point they join. And you can see here in a transverse view, you see two veins joining together. You may also have deeper vessels coming up to join with more superficial vessels. And this is important that if you are accessing the superficial branch, do not stick through the posterior wall into the posterior branch. So a note on the equipment that we'll be using. We'll be using the linear array probe. This offers us the highest resolution and the best image both for localization, identification of the vessels, and also for visualization of the needle for catheterization. So there are multiple different types of catheters you can use, but most commonly you'll be using a catheter over the needle system. These will generally be a slightly longer than your average landmark IV catheters in order to assure seating of the catheter and prevent extravasation. Here are some examples, such as here we have a 20 gauge one and three quarter inch catheter or 45 millimeters in length. And here we have an 18 gauge with two and a half inch catheter length or 64 millimeters. And the reason the lengths are important is that tells you how deep a vessel you can access because you'll need certain amount of catheter within the vessel. And the gauge tells you about the flow rate with respect to fluid resuscitation, medication administration, or power injection for contrasted studies. The length of the catheter is important. To have a good ultrasound guided catheter that is seated well in the vessel and prevent extravasation or dislodgement, you wanna aim for about half of the catheter length within the vessel. And what this means is when you find a vessel, it is not the depth from the skin surface to the vessel itself, it is the length that the catheter will travel from the puncture site through the soft tissue to the vessel itself and how much of the catheter will remain in the vessel. And what you wanna aim for is half the length. So if you have a catheter that's 45 millimeters in length or 2.5 inches, you wanna make sure the catheter travels less than two centimeters of distance from puncture site to the vessel in order to make sure you have adequate catheter within the vessel to prevent dislodgement or extravasation. After your catheter has been placed, if you see an image like this, where the catheter is just barely in the vessel with the tip touching the back wall, this tells me that this is likely too short a catheter and runs the risk of dislodgement and extravasation over time. If you see the catheter firmly within the vessel and the catheter is resting against the back wall and layering in the vessel, that tells me that there's likely adequate catheter within the vessel to prevent dislodgement and extravasation. A rule of thumb is if you're accessing below the antecubital fossa, you can consider the 1.75 inch catheters. However, if you're accessing above the antecubital fossa, you should be really using the longer catheters because of the greater amount of soft tissue that you're traveling through 
and the amount of flexion and bunching of that soft tissue as the patient moves their arm. In preparation for vascular access, be sure to place your tourniquet on the patient just like you do for landmark IVs. This will cause your vessel to both distend, making a larger target, and also allow increased venous pressure to allow puncture. So here is a vessel on a patient where we can see the average size of it. However, once the tourniquet is on, you can see that the vessel is much larger now. We'll also have distension and increased venous pressure, allowing puncture of the catheter into the vessel without puncturing through the back wall with collapse of the vessel. You can see here there is some sludging within the vessel and some blood has some slower flow in there, causing some deflectors to appear. This tells me that the tourniquet is on well and impeding venous flow, allowing that distension and increased venous pressure. Let's talk a little bit about positioning your patient. Depending on which vessel you choose, you may have to position the patient's arm differently in order to have an appropriate area for access. Just like any procedure, poor setup and poor positioning will guarantee you failure. You want to make sure you have everything aligned and placed in order to give you the most optimal chance of success. If you're targeting different vessels, whether it's in the anacube or the forearm, you want to position that arm appropriately. You may have to rotate the arm, you may have to place it on a bedside table or on another supporting structure in order to have the arm positioned. For instance here, we can see a cross section of the arm. So you can see here, if we are targeting that superficial basilic vessel, it is along the medial edge of the arm. What we don't want to do is access along that vertical face. What we want to do is rotate the patient's arm so we now have a flat surface in order to place the probe and cannulate. You also want to make sure the arm is positioned in line with your machine and your supplies. Make sure your supplies are close enough to reach easily. Here's an example of a poor setup. So you can have the patient's arm positioned well so you can easily see the vessel and you can have your machine set up. However, if you are standing here, you are going to be accessing from left to right rather than in line with the vessel. And the machine's going to be to your left, meaning as you're accessing, you're going to have to turn your body to look at the screen. If you're standing here so you can access in line with the direction of the vessel, the machine is now behind you, meaning you'll have to turn your torso and turn your head in order to visualize the image. A much better setup is here where you're standing distal to the arm. You will be sticking and cannulating in line with the direction of the vessel. And as you lift your head up, you can easily see the screen on the machine and then look back down to your cannulation site. This is a good setup for both position and patient arm. If you're accessing a position where you may have to abduct the arm, that is also appropriate as you have that arm on a supporting structure, but you're gonna be standing here. You'll also be accessing in line with the vessel and have the machine in view. So remember, however you have to position the patient, moving the bed, the gurney, and other things in the room in order to have a good setup for both visualization of the vessel, the direction of cannulation, and being able to visualize your machine will offer you the best chance of success. Let's talk about accessing the vessel itself. Using a transverse or short access, we're gonna find and assess that vessel. Before we cannulate, we want to identify which is the vein. We also know that the walls do touch, and that tells us that there is no superficial thrombus within there. You can see here that this vessel has a thrombus within it. When we compress, the walls do not touch, and you see some grayscale deflectors in there. Now, fresh thrombus does not always appear echogenic, so you want to make sure you can compress the vessels and both walls touch, showing that there is no thrombus. In this example here, you can see a non-occlusive thrombus within that vessel, so as we compress, the vessel does compress slightly, but the walls do not touch, telling us that there is thrombus within there. Of note, this is also a catheter-associated thrombus, as you can see the catheter within the clot itself. Do not attempt to compress in the sagittal plane, because what can happen is your probe can slide away from the vessel, making it look like you compressed it, but really all that's happening is your probe is sliding away, making you think it's a vein when it's not, or making you think that there is no thrombus in there when there is. So compress in the short axis, not in the long. Let's talk about actually cannulating the vessel. There is the out-of-plane approach, meaning the needle is approaching out of the plane of sound, or the short axis approach. This is less than ideal. You can see the diagram here, both in a sagittal and a transverse plane. On the right side of the screen, you're going to see your image. The needle will appear as a hyperchoic dot with some ring down artifact, and you'll see the vein and the artery. However, the needle will appear similar, and you cannot really differentiate between the proximal needle, the mid needle, or the distal needle. And in this example, it'll look like here, if you're imaging too proximal, the needle is not near the vein and you'll advance further. Whereas if you image here, it looks like the needle is in the vein. But if you actually visualize the tip of the needle, you'll visualize that you've actually punctured through the vein and you are now in the artery. So the short axis does have that limitation that the needle will appear very similar throughout its length. The sagittal plane will allow you visualization of the entire needle shaft all the way to the tip to make sure that tip is localized within the lumen of the vessel and not through the back wall or into side tissue. However, a limitation of the sagittal plane is that it's a very thin ultrasound beam. 
And if you are not facile at manipulating your probe and your needle, you may lose sight of your needle, which is why this is a skill that needs to be practiced and developed. And the reason we advocate in-plane needle visualization, it allows you to visualize the needle tip. So you can do a procedure like this where you visualize your needle tip puncturing the vessel, making sure you're within the vessel and being able to thread your catheter to reduce complications and optimize success. So the first step is to rotate from a transverse to a sagittal plane. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna find that nice circular vessel, you're gonna center it, and you're gonna rotate the probe about its middle, watching that circle become an oval and slowly extend until you have the sagittal plane with the vessel extending across the screen. And what you wanna visualize is a long vessel extending throughout your field of view with nice bright walls. And that tells me you're in the center of the vessel and you have a wonderful view for cannulation. For doing this procedure, we're gonna be using a linear array probe. And the reason linear array probes have these flares near the probe face is so that you can have this very low grip, more like a pencil rather than a knife. And that allows you very fine motor control of the probe. You also note that we're gonna have a finger extended to stabilize that probe against the patient to prevent sliding of the probe within the gel. You also wanna look at your probe casing and note where the seam is and the middle of the probe. That will help you localize where the ultrasound beam is and line your needle up with the middle of the probe and therefore the ultrasound beam. So you can see here, we're gonna be accessing a forearm vein on this phantom as a demonstration. We have a very low grip on our probe. We have our hand braced on the patient. We have the arm position so that we're accessing in the direction of the travel of the vessel. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go from our transverse view. We're gonna slowly rotate to get a sagittal view of that vessel. Nice bright walls, we're in the center of the vessel. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna align with the center of the probe, we're gonna stick, and then once I see my needle tip, I can then watch the screen as I direct my needle tip to the anterior wall of the vessel, puncture the anterior wall, enter the lumen, make sure my needle tip is within the lumen of the vessel, and then be able to thread my catheter into the vessel. You can see here on this phantom, we're now going to be accessing a vessel in the upper arm that's a little further into the soft tissue. We have repositioned the arm, so we still have a flat surface. We have the low grip on the probe with our hand braced. And once again, we're gonna rotate the probe to move from a transverse view of the vessel to a sagittal, but now we're using a longer catheter because the vessel is a little deeper. Once again, we have that sagittal view of the vessel. We're gonna line our needle up with the seam of the probe, sticking right by the probe face, and we're gonna see our needle tip, and we can advance that needle through the anterior wall into the vessel. And we make sure that the needle tip has punctured into the lumen of the vessel without puncture of the posterior wall. We can now thread our catheter. Something that can help you align the needle with the probe is a little bit of a lift technique. And what happens is you can see the seam of the probe or the center of the probe outlined here in red. And we're gonna show what happens. You're gonna rock the probe up slightly so you have an easier time aligning that needle with the seam of the probe. And now that allows you to visualize the needle tip. And this is a common thing. When you have the needle tip within the tissue, you wanna make sure you clean up your view slightly so that you have a clear view of the needle tip and the vessel. You do not wanna advance the needle tip to gain a view. You wanna make sure you have a view of the needle tip as you advance. Here's a point of view visualization of why the lift technique helps on the central access model, which also holds for peripheral access. You can see here with this low grip on the probe and my hand braced, my thumb is blocking the seam of the probe. Now you could bend down to see where the seam is. However, if you were to rock your hand up slightly with that little bit of a lift, you can now clearly see the seam of the probe to align your needle. So the lift allows you one, a little extra space to access, but also allows you to align the needle with the seam of the probe more easily. Here's a cannulation example. We have visualized the needle tip and we're puncturing into the vessel, making sure our needle tip is within the lumen of the vessel and not contacting the back wall and not stuck within the anterior wall. Here's another example of cannulation where we can see the valve as that little bulge with the leaflet visible. And we're gonna puncture proximal to the valve so that we can thread the catheter through there, making sure we have not punctured the valve leaflet or directly into the valve itself. Here's another cannulation example. What we're gonna do is make sure we have a nice sagittal view. We're gonna lift the probe up slightly. You can see the soft tissue lift away. We're gonna puncture the skin. And now once we're through the skin, we can see that we have to align the needle with the vessel on our image. And there we have our needle tip. We can puncture through that anterior wall make sure we're within the lumen of the vessel and then thread our catheter. So here we have an example of a vein that branches into a superficial and a deeper branch. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure we puncture and the needle tip stays away from that posterior wall. So we're puncturing into the superficial branch and not through the back wall into the deeper branch. And the sagittal plane allows us to visualize the needle tip and its relation to the back wall. One reason that many cannulations can fail 
is that you have punctured through the back wall and you have extravasation. Another reason the sagittal plane is very important in this example, and what happens is you can puncture through the anterior wall, but you have a very limited space. So now that we're through the anterior wall, you can drop your angle, visualize the needle tip in relation to the back wall of the vessel and be able to advance and make sure you do not puncture the posterior wall. This would not be feasible in a short access, which is why the sagittal plane is much better for these very difficult access cases and should be practiced on easier cases so you're facile for those very difficult ones. Here you can see an example of cannulation in a vessel with some venous sludging because the tourniquet has been on and you can see that catheter is threaded into the vessel successfully. Something important to note is that your catheter does not extend to the needle tip or across the entire bevel. So the bevel and the needle tip can enter the vessel and you can have flash into the chamber or blood return, but you have not made a large enough hole in the anterior wall of the vessel to pass the catheter, nor has a catheter entered the vessel itself. In order to have success, you have to get the catheter tip into the lumen of the vessel. And the catheter tip is located at the posterior edge of the bevel. So when you're looking at vascular access, what you want to note is not just the needle tip, but you want to note the back end of the bevel. That edge of that bevel, that step off, is where your catheter tip is. That has to be past the anterior wall and within the lumen of the vessel in order for you to thread that catheter successfully and cannulate that vessel correctly. Now, this is the other area where vascular access fails when you have not gotten the catheter through the anterior wall. And so when you attempt to thread that catheter, it bunches in the soft tissue anterior to the vessel and you fail in cannulation. So in this example here, you have gotten the needle tip into the vessel, but more importantly, the back end of the bevel is through the anterior wall, meaning the catheter has entered the vessel, so that you can now thread the catheter into the lumen of the vessel. After cannulation, you want to confirm that your catheter is seated well. So after catheter has been secured in place, what you want to do is return with your ultrasound probe and visualize the catheter within the lumen of the vessel. Now remember, because we are doing this as a sterile procedure, you want to do this after the tegaderm has been applied or at a site distal to the cannulation site rather than re-imaging over the puncture site itself. And what you want to see is a catheter within the vessel layering against the back wall. That tells you that the catheter is within the vessel, it has adequate length, and it has not punctured the posterior wall. Here's another example. The catheter may dimple the back wall. As long as it does not puncture it, it is okay. You can see that the tourniquet is on the patient making it much easier for cannulation and visualization of the needle tip and catheter edge within the vessel. However, once the tourniquet is off, this vessel then decreases in size as a much smaller target. So you may want to confirm the vessel has been cannulating the catheter seated well with the tourniquet still on in order to give yourself a larger target when you're beginning. Now, once you find that vessel, what you want to do is flush the catheter and you can visualize the flushing here and that the saline flush is staying within the lumen of the vessel. There's no extravasation or soft tissue leaking. So now that you have localized the catheter within the vessel and show successful cannulation, you want to flush the catheter to make sure that there's no extravasation or problems. And you can see here that you can see the saline being flushed within the vessel. And you can clearly see no extravasation. All of the flush stays within the lumen of the vessel. Now, if you have a small vessel with a tourniquet off, when you flush, that forward flow of the flush may cause that vein to collapse, making it a little more difficult to visualize appropriate flushing. Peripheral vascular access should still be performed in a sterile fashion. It may not be full barrier techniques, such as central venous access, but you want to maintain sterility of the puncture site. And what this means is you're going to do skin prep like you do for any other IV access, whether it's chlorhexidine or other preparatory materials that you use in your institution. You're going to make sure that you're using single-use gel to prevent contamination of the site, and you're going to use a bioocclusive dressing with a sterile surface over the probe or a probe cover. You want to use single-use gel for your ultrasound guidance, and one of the easiest ways is to use surgical lubricating jelly that most departments and hospitals have readily available and is single-use rather than using your multi-use gel packets. You can use a sterile probe cover. However, more easily, you can use a sterile bioocclusive dressing to wrap around the probe surface. And what's going to happen is you're going to take your linear array probe, you're going to take your bioocclusive dressing, making sure that you are not touching the part that will go over the probe face and you wrap it around the probe and remove the cardboard. Once again, taking care not to touch the probe surface, which is your sterile field. Once you contact that, that is no longer sterile. So you can see here, we're manipulating the probe in the wrap to ensure that we are not touching the face, but touching the probe is okay because that will not be contacting the puncture site where we have to have sterility. We now have a sterile surface of the probe to work with, along with sterile single-use gel and a sterile catheter that we are inserting. Remember, once a probe surface contacts other structures, you do not want to place it back over the cannulation site unless you have maintained sterility. Special equipment note, you may be using Seldinger catheters. 
And what this can be done is for difficult venous access or arterial access. So just like we've talked about before, you're going to use the in-plane vascular access technique, and you're going to make sure the needle tip and the edge of the bevel are within the lumen of the vessel. But because this is a cell danger technique, an additional step prior to threading the catheter is you're going to advance the wire. And this is where you can confirm that the wire is within the lumen of the vessel that you're targeting as a catheter will follow the wire. You can see here we have threaded the wire into the vessel and we're confirming that the wire sits within the lumen of the vessel without puncture of the posterior wall. Using this bright hyperchoric structure with ring down artifact being the wire clearly within the vessel lumen. And this allows us to thread the catheter over that wire into the vessel. Documentation of the procedure should be performed in the patient's chart as with all procedures. However, because of the ultrasound guidance, an additional need is image documentation and retention. Ideally, you should have images of the precannulation assessment of those vessels and that the catheter has been placed within the lumen of the vessel successfully without complication. This shows that an appropriate vessel was chosen for cannulation and that cannulation was successful with the catheter seated well. In summary, a few take-home points. Deep vessels are paired with the artery in the vein. Make sure you identify the vein to cannulate and not the artery. Superficial veins run alone. Make sure you have the tourniquet on for your cannulation as it will help the vein distend and make cannulation easier and more successful. Position the patient and your equipment correctly so that you have an optimal procedure in order to optimize your chances of success. Cannulate using in-plane or sagittal views and capture an image of the target and that you successfully acquired that target. Don't forget to like and subscribe.